Um, the next part of this has to do with the ambiguity overwhelm. From what, a is pure, am what is ambiguity? With from, a, from a processing point of view, um, <clears throat> the time it's taking the brain to figure out which of a letter's potential sounds it's supposed to actually sound like is longer than the attention span of somebody reading can actually process and sus if you ever listen to a child read mm -hmm. or you hear the stutter in their voice yes if you could drop right through the stutter that that you're hearing watch their eyes track their eyes you'd find that their eyes have locked onto a letter or a series of letters that their mind has gone into a bog trying to figure out which of its potential sounds and their voice just dropped out on them while their mind's processing this okay. so so th in that sense i'm saying they have been overwhelmed with ambiguity, the ambiguity that's in the code. Okay. So the children of the code first introduces the culture of reading, the culture of writing, and... and the and significance of it. Like I said, we've talked about 35 million children suffering from this. There's 92 million adults in this country right now that are reading below the fifth grade level. And according How many? 92 million. 92. And according to the uh, National Center for Learning Disabilities, it's costing those 92 million adults some $230 billion a year in lost economic opportunity because they can't read. Tell me about the neuroscience behind this inability to decode at the adult level. Well, <coughs> it's connected. Of course, as you get older, it's harder and harder to, to Why develop the brain. Well, the, the plasticity of the brain. I mean, there is, uh, the, the, again, processing this code is something that the brain's never had any evolutionary experience in doing. Mm -hmm. We are now taking, uh, uh, the, for example, in this series that we're producing, we have the uh, chair of neuroscience from Rutgers. We have the head of cognitive science at MIT and the psychologists from uh, Harvard, head of psychology at Harvard. And we are z zeroing in on just what's going on inside the brain. What are the circuits in the brain that are involved in reading and at different la levels of reading? Right? And the timing, the timing of, of, is the, of the brain development. Precisely. On the one hand, if you look at the um, time it takes for the brain to just recognize a letter, mm -hmm. for the, recognize the difference between an A or a B or a capital A and a lowercase a, t watching the brain actually do this through MRI scans, mm -hmm. we can see that it takes almost a tenth of a second to make a distinction like mm -hmm. that, for, to process the, the visual distinction of a letter and, and map it over to its corresponding sound, even when it's not ambiguous. Right. It was just an A. It's just an A. When, when the A has seven possible sounds that depend on which of the next three letters are, are adjacent to it, then you've got this looping bog that's going on in the mind as it's trying to figure out, it's, first of all, it has to hold on to all of these possible alternative sounds and then sort through which of the possible sounds it's supposed to actually sound like and then jam it back in on our virtually heard stream um, fast enough to simulate talking to ourselves. And reading naturally. And reading naturally. Now, my wife's a first grade teacher, and she tells me over and over again that the, the child's brain is ready to learn at certain times. Right. And when they're stage appropriate developments. Okay. Yeah. Describe that, and how does and how does the, how does a learning disability become a reading disability? Well, the. Um, and when does it happen? And what we're talking about really is is opening a national discussion through right. Children of the Code. Right, exactly. By, by visiting the neuroscience, the culture, the history. The psychology. And, and, and the psychology and the large view right. of, of what... We want to demythologize de this whole okay. writing and reading thing and take it, put it in its right historical context and then get inside of our brains and understand what's going on with it. Break outside the box uh, of the way we've defined reading in the past. Okay, let's get back to that, that window when the child's brain is ready. Uh, uh, clearly the adult brain becomes less plastic but the child has a certain window of opportunity at different age levels. Is that something that, that I can take on a calendar and say, okay, the kid's four years and three days? You can't do it that way, but I think you can um, if you were tracking a child, if you were very But we have national standards that say that certain well, things Well, sure, those are gross approximations, that, okay. right, based on statistical portraits of what, what on average works. Uh, there's a difference between how I would, you know, try to suggest you do this at a national level of mm -hmm. oversight from a research perspective versus if you were actually with a child Right. When you're with a child, the, the, the key is to meet them right on the edge of their reading. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, what's appropriate for them is what they're able to actually handle on the very edge of their reading. And that comes down to, again, we go back to um, if you've watched a child 
read, struggle to read, then every time they come up on that edge where their voice is dropping out and their mind's busy spinning trying to figure things out, that's the great opportunity. But what goes wrong? What goes wrong is they learn to be ashamed of the fact that they're not doing it well. How does shame form in the process of learning? Shame's a natural response to anything that creates a kind of diminishment of, of their sense of expectation of self. So in this case, mm -hmm. um, they see people around them, their parents, everybody says reading is so important, so critical. And they recognize as they read that they're constantly or frequently dropping out in okay. this ambiguity bog we were talking about. Like we were saying, the child's reading along and then all of a sudden their voice drops out, they're not quite sure what to say. Mm. Okay. So the more that they experience that, they have to, they come to blame themselves for it. I mean, if you look at the 3,000 reports from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, it's very clear the first response that children have, the first response, the first general psychological response that they have to reading difficulties is to blame themselves. They feel ashamed of themselves. How do they cope? Well, it depends on who they're with. You mm -hmm. no, can't make it such a generalization. But unfortunately, the consequence of this is that in order to read well, the mind unconsciously has to convert these letters into sounds and put them back into the mind, so to speak, in this virtually mm -hmm. heard stream or speak them out as they're reading, right? Right. So there's this internal unconscious assembly. It's not like in the early days of the alphabet where you saw a letter, you, saw the, you said the sound, the thing just came out like a kind of gatling gun into a stream. It all made sense that was reading. Now the letters have to come into the mind, be stored, held on to, mm -hmm. and worked out, and then still jammed back into the stream so as to make a coherent thought stream from the reading. What happens when, when that takes too long is the child's attention breaks down and the whole thing becomes very frustrating. Now they start to blame themselves. Mm -hmm. Once they start to blame themselves, their mind is now fragmented. Instead of having uh, the attention, what's called the intentional resources or memory resources to just be self-transparently processing the code, they bec their mind becomes bifurcated and part of their mental energy is going into how they feel about themselves, the shame that they're feeling. And as any, any uh, you know, human being will kind of uh, own up to if you press them on it, nobody wants to feel ashamed of themselves. So they try to avoid what's causing them to feel shame. So what's, what we're doing in the way that we currently teach reading is we've created this environment in which most of our children are spending most yeah. of their school time in an environment that's making them feel ashamed about the functioning of their mind. This is a big, this is a big issue. Let's talk about what the program is then. Mm -hmm. um, again, we know that this is, this is sweeping overview of what writing is and, the, and its mm -hmm. effect on culture. Mm -hmm. And we see that, uh, that as, as we become a smaller planet, that, the, that English is becoming a dominant language. Right. We see that, that learning disabilities are more prevalent in, in the English culture uh, or English-speaking cultures than, than other language cultures. Mm -hmm. um, but we begin to understand through this program that learning disabilities, some of which are unique to the fact that we speak English, but are not necessarily uh, unique to, to all learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. But as we begin to understand these disabilities, we see something hopeful. We see the op opportunity for a national dialogue. Uh, or maybe a revisitation of what, what, how we teach children. There's a number of new and emerging um, hopeful uh, methodologies mm -hmm. that are less um, trying to develop a right way. I, I, we don't have time now to track through the history of the reading wars and where they've taken us, but there has been an a, a emergence in the cognitive science and in the neurological sciences where we've started to understand what reading is in, in some new and powerful ways. It hasn't radiated out into the general public awareness, and that's a piece of what we're trying to do.